Okay, well, without further ado, six o'clock. Welcome to Advanced Face-Off Concepts with Joan Ardella. So, um, you know what, I'm gonna let you take this away. I see a lot of repeat names, which is great. So people have come back for session two. Um, you know what, go, go at it. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Brad. All right, well, I'm excited to share with you guys um, kind of the next phase of drills when talking about implementing the basics and then taking that next step to make you more game ready or more effective. Um, and then talking about some situations where maybe you guys could use a little bit more coaching, say like teaching your long hold to face off or how you incorporate wing play into your practice plan so you can create some more 3v3 face off situations. Um, and a lot of this stuff that comes directly from my experience coaching college. So I really hope you guys enjoy it. Um, and today, because it's a little bit more advanced, I'll be showing more video um, of some drills that I've worked on and uh, the Google Doc that I provided everyone with last time. I just populated it with these advanced drills kind of to lead that document. So you guys all already have it. I'll put the link in here um, again today. So you guys can, for those of you who may have missed it the first time, can grab it as well. But all of these are up on YouTube. You guys can access them with your teams or if you want to just continue to dive in further and check out more of our drills. Um, we have about like 75 to 80 drills on there, which is something we've worked on over the past couple of years and I'm pretty proud of it. So excited to share in our first one. Once I feel like you teach your kids how to clamp properly and they feel ready, this is a great drill. We call it partner tight clamps to work on driving off those knees and feeling pressure with their hands right away, as well as continuing to drive down the line over the top of the ball, make sure we're getting diagonal, getting extended and giving our opponent pressure or our partner pressure when you guys are having either, you know, a rep dummy or a coach helping them out. All right. This one is called tight clamps. Workout Wednesday. So this is a great warm-up drill that we've been doing at our sessions called partner tight clamps. Very simple, but I think it gives you those visual targets where not only your right hand should be punching, but your left. So as I come down and sit in my stance, Sam's gonna put his hands as the targets, and my goal is to snap this right hand towards the ball and then drive right through it. In my left hand, we don't wanna just drive down that line, we wanna get a little bit of extension so we can work our way around that ball and set ourselves up for a good second move. So these are my targets. I ideally wanna get down and snap right into the ground at the, bottom, the base of his knuckles. So it'll be down, set, whistle. And I work on good body position, getting, getting to a good angle and dropping my weight into that ball or right above my right glove, down. Set. And every time I want to make sure that ball's in the throat, my, my lower body and core is engaged and my head, chest, and shoulders are right above that ball so I'm ready to make my second move. Try this one out. Use it as a warm-up drill. Thank you guys for watching. As always, we'll see you. Now that one, I think the, the key points there, when we talk about driving into the ball and recruiting those legs to make sure our clamp is as strong as possible. The biggest thing you like, the biggest indicator of whether or not your kids are doing this right is if everything is pointed diagonally. And obviously it's really easy to see there because it's filmed. So if you're having somebody watch and you're not filming some of your face off work, you want to make sure that things point diagonal when they finish and that'll set them up for success both on their first move and throughout the tie up. Next, we're going to be talking about a drill for muscle memory. So everybody wants to have, if you have a good face-off guy, most of them have the ability to go forward. And a coach loves a face-off guy who can, you know, potentially press the ball forward because it gives your team transit, like a transition threat. It puts pressure on the other teams to have to drop their wing guys back so you can, you know, free up some ground balls or space for your face-off guy to exit to himself. So this drill is working on our speed. It's great for warming up and working on getting in and out of this face off. You don't need a wall to do it. We did it in this drill. If you had say 20 balls, you could just do sets of 20, but this one I call muscle memory or fireball. And um, a lot of the younger guys like this one a lot. We set a helmet up and we will have them do it where they pop the ball into the helmet instead in this one. Um, is really good for just getting a lot of perfect reps in a short period of time.
What's going on guys? Welcome back to another episode of Workout Wednesday. Today, our drill is really focused on muscle memory. It's called Firebomb. We're gonna do it with a wall in front of us. I'm here with Coach Noah Rack. We just finished up our Rhode Island training tonight. The grind never stops. And I gotta give a shout out to our friends at Fogolax. They're at it. And Noah is what we call the placer. He's gonna place the ball down for me half plant and put his right hand out. So I have to drag and secure that ball to pop it by him. Working on having perfect technique each rep. You can call for me. Down, set, go. Down, set, go. Down. And you guys get the point. We would continue to go for about a minute. Now, the reason I think that one is so effective because you can do sets of, say, a minute or two minutes and you just go back and forth. And now I can also do this where if some my partner was setting the ball up for me, I can work on tossing the ball between my legs. So if I were to put a target like my helmet here, say just back behind me to the left or behind me to the right, you can work on that same motion of clamping, getting up and tossing that ball through your legs. So I think that's a great one. Now, when kids pop the ball through their legs, I think there's two ways that you could do it. Some people like, as we kind of mentioned last time, when you pro hop and pinch that left hand, a lot of kids like keeping this left hand up because they feel they're already here and it's quicker to toss through our legs. What I would teach when you're teaching through the legs, drag to about the tips of your toes and try to release that hand up and off the ground by the time you get to your ankles, just like hiking a football, chest stays low, I drag this down and then I'm gonna flick. Now, if I were to do this the way that other people like to do it, where you go against guys who might be really strong or good at counters and all the people that play you know, at the highest levels can counter you if you hang in there too long. I like to bring my left hand down, slide my hand up a little bit because I feel like I'm more accurate and then throw that ball through my legs. So as I were to get to that pro hop, I would come down to make sure that nobody could slide underneath me I get those feet turned and again, dragging to the tips of my toes and releasing by the time I get to my ankles. When I release that, I'm actually turning my knuckles over so the face of the stick opens up as I pop that backwards, right? And we try to throw it through our legs so that if we're going to ourself, we can drop, step, and swing to seal off our opponent. Our next one, remove, or removing the false step or improving our efficiency. In this drill, we're actually gonna be facing off next to a wall or say, you could just have somebody stand and put their foot where this wall is. And I'll show you guys the drill, but basically I see a lot of guys step out with their left foot. It's a sign of them having a bad stance. And also if you do it too far, you're taking your body and your weight away from the ball. So this drill is aimed at cleaning up that, that false step. And if, as you progress, this is something that you could really have your guys work on, and it'll really help them recruit that power from their legs and drive down that line so they're as explosive as possible and increase their chances of winning. This week, we want to address a topic that a few of our coaches have already touched on, but we want to take it a step further, no pun intended, with a two-part drill. So what we're going to discuss today is how to remove dropping my left foot back or having that false step when I face off so my body's not overly like elongated and I don't lose any power. So I'm going to use the wall for immediate feedback. If the weight is on my pinky toe, my foot is likely to slip out or drop back when I take that face off and hear that whistle. Now, if I put that foot on my big toe like we teach, I'm gonna drive into that ball and if I start to feel that wall, I know that I'm putting the weight in the wrong part of my foot and I'm developing bad habits. So this is a really good drill that you can do on your own anywhere in your house for the wall and all I'm gonna do is work on snapping down that line, getting my body in good position for part one of this drill. So down, set, bang. I drive in, no false step, I engage my lower body, my upper body, and I have a nice, tight, strong clamp. Now, for part two of this drill, I'm gonna ask my trusty uh, protege, 
Derek to come help me out. And what Derek's gonna do is he's just gonna provide a half plant. But what we're gonna do from here is work on driving in, getting my hips up so I can make room for my upper body to get nice and low. And I'm gonna have to keep a tight rotation so I'm not gonna end up with my arms overly extended or super far back where I lose power. Down, set, go. Now, if we wanted to add some pace to this drill, it would be Derek's turn. And we'll just keep going in succession. I'm gonna let him get up nice and neat in his stance. I'm gonna set the ball up appropriately. Down. And same thing, he's focusing on driving off that big toe, getting his hips up, getting his chest, shoulders down, his arms in that bench press power position, and having a nice tight rotation. Set, go. Very good, pinch, exit. And now the last part of this drill, and seeing a lot of guys playing these fall tournaments, people don't exit properly. One thing I can do is use my opponent as a shield from those wing guys. So as I do this and I exit, I'm gonna exit right towards Derek's back. Down, set. And by exiting there, there is no way he's gonna be able to check me and I use him as an obstacle from those wing guys. Thank you guys for now that one's great to do with a partner. And I like, as you guys were to work on that with your teams, you can add the pace or the other aspects of it. I think for starters, just getting someone to kind of push off that left toe is going to be really, really effective in them transferring their weight towards the ball and being stronger um, as they face off. And I think all those things can really help us um, in terms of just recruiting power into our face off. recruiting power into that face off and making sure that your guys are actually using both their legs and their upper body. Next, I want to talk about long stick face offs. Now, uh, no difficulty one sec. Yeah, next I want to talk about long stick face offs and I think when I brought the long pull out beforehand, Brad kind of laughed. He's like, what are you using that for? It's like, well, everyone needs to be prepared for an emergency, whether your face-off guy goes down, your backup's not getting the job done, or all your guys are just having a bad day, slash you're going against somebody who's, you know, more polished and just better. You need to be able to teach your pulls how to face off. Now, the worst thing you could do is just send them out there with no guidance because, number one, you have to think about how many reps – this really good face-off guy has taken in their life and how many times they've probably seen a pull versus this kid, you're just throwing out there to figure it out, right? Your chances are very slim to winning if he's never practiced. So if you, you know, take one, two guys on your team and you just teach them a couple things, I guarantee you'll be in much better shape than if you didn't. So this video, a couple of our other coaches are going to show you, but the things that I would teach my pull to do is if I were grabbing the stick, I would be super light with my hands. I'd be neutral grip. My left hand would be close as well, and I'd kind of curl this wrist over the top. Now, they would want to kind of float their hands and be as light as possible, and they're doing what we – and we'll show some counters later, what I kind of talked about last week, that scissor rake. So my left hand's going to pull, and my right hand's going to swipe in. Now, when they do that, they're going to swing their feet to the right, so their main goal is not getting fast broken, right? If you were to get fast broken, that is probably the worst thing that you could do on this face-off. So what I want everyone to think about is this stand-up stance we talked about. You know, your pole's not going to have any reference usually of like his knee down stance, so I wouldn't say to tell him to go down and then move his right foot to the right of where his knee's positioned. I would tell him to think about placing his right foot about a foot length from the ball and then placing this left foot somewhere just outside a shoulder width apart where he feels comfortable. Now, a bigger kid's probably going to be further out, right? And a kid who's a little bit shorter might be able to get tighter in. But the main thing is they're super light on their hands and on their balls of their feet. They are not going to win this face-off. Or they, their objective is not to just win the face-off or win this race. They want to buy those wing guys time and make this guy have to think about his exit. Believe me, those two things – can create much more success than just telling your guy to stand up and throw checks. So what he's going to do, again, is kind of swipe over this ball and pull this left hand back, right? And that scissor rake plays right into sliding down and being able to check. And by swinging those hips, 
and feet to the right. Now we're straddling his stick, his stomachs, our stomachs right by his helmet. And he now has to get six feet away from wherever I am to make sure that he can pop and catch this cleanly. So obviously this guy's going to want to be aggressive. The pole, when the opposing faceoff guy kind of puts his back to us or defensive exits or defensive turns like we talked about last time, you want to make sure you never step past this stick with both your feet because you leave yourself susceptible of getting fast broken. So his left foot is always going to trail the head of the stick. And now as soon as he sees that faceoff guy's butt end go up, we're going to check down right on that right glove. And that's when you can create a ton of 50-50 situations. So I think having that move alone will really, really help set your guys up for success. What I would do with the wings is to make sure that they are locked off, right? And as long as your long stick understands his job is not to always win the ball, but not to give up fast breaks, you'll be making the opposing faceoff guy work much harder. You won't be giving up transition and he'll have no outlets for those wings as long as those guys lock off and don't allow them to pass the ball to him. Now, like as faceoff guys carry down, I would say as he gets close to the top of the box, your defenseman should no longer press out and you should recover because you don't want to give up easy goals to face off guys who can shoot. Okay. So we will get into our long stick face off video. Hey guys, Coach Barber here with Faceoff Factory out at Best of the West in Mesquite, Nevada. I'm here with Travis today and we're going to talk about long stick faceoffs. So when we're talking about having our long stick take our faceoffs, when Travis goes down, he's going to have his right foot pointed towards the ball and his left foot flat along the line. When he comes down, he's, we want our pole to be traditional grip for two reasons. One, it's just a quicker move for them to exit. And also, it gives them a chance to slide their hands down their stick so they can get ready to check us depending on where we're going. When Travis comes down, what he was going to want to do is he's going to be super light on his hands. Move we're going to teach today is just called a laser, which we've done before in some of our videos. When we come down, our left hand is more important here. Our right hand almost has no grip on it. We're going to put our fingers right underneath. Our left hand is going to be underneath. What we're getting ready to do is actually open our hand so it comes backwards and we're going to be coming across the line trying to swipe that ball out. So when we go down, set, go, I'm going to try to clamp as the faceoff guy. All Travis is trying to do is roll, get this ball in the corner of his stick, and rip across as fast as he can, trying to, at a minimum, create a 50-50 for the faceoff guy or make it a little bit harder for the guy to exit. Now, if I end up clamping it, what Travis is gonna end up wanting to do, because he has a six foot pole, is a lot of faceoff guys are trying to get out as fast as they can. If it gets caught up here and I have to adjust, he can now take a step. He is directly over me, belly to head. He has a six foot pole ready, so when I'm starting to rotate, the one thing he wants to do is stay right in front of me. He does not wanna overcommit to this side, because two things, one, his pole is still here, and at the same time, if I end up doing this and I drag and he falls for that step, I could pop right and I can still potentially have a break. So he wants to stay directly above me and not overcommit. He wants to use the size of his pole in play. Now, from the faceoff guy's perspective, if I'm going against the pole, I'm going to come down, set, go. If I end up clamping it before he can actually laser it, he now has two options. One, if I end up getting it clean, I want to get out as fast as I can. And so I would either try to go forward if I can, because a lot of poles don't take a lot of faceoffs during practice. So if they're on their feet, they think it's a pretty easy position to be in. But if you get it fast enough, it's very hard for them to turn. So my first option before he can get out is to go forward. If I can't get it out forward, my second option would be to go back as fast as I can. So if Travis comes down and I end up clamping it, down, sit, go. My option is to be here, so now I can either have two options. One, go here. Odds are the pole is going to be able to follow me, so now I can roll out, and I can either get upfield, or I can throw it back to my goalie. Last option, a lot of guys I see try to de-exit. The only reason I don't like de-exits against the pole is because you're taking more time for one, the wings to get in, and two, for him to adjust to where you're going. So what I like to end up using is once I clamp it, I like to sweep my left foot back and drag through, get my shoulder around to protect my stick from the pole, 
and then I will easily go back to my goalie because we have man advantage in the back. And that was this week's workout Wednesday. So I think he does a great job there of talking about what to do against a pole as well, which I think is really important. And I'm going to talk about the wing play associated with that um, on the whiteboard here in a second. Do you want to take a question? Yeah, yeah, of course. So what's a knee down face-off players counter to an LSM raking, if you can tell what he's going to do, you know, rotating. So, yeah, so there he – Tyler didn't really talk about that. Now, when someone is raking that ball – let me move this down a little bit. When someone's raking that ball, essentially they're trying to get it to move down the line like he just showed you. So, for anyone who's raking this ball down the line, a lot of people think, all right, well, the ball's going to be here. I may as well just stay really low and clamp to there. And yes, that does work for some people, especially if they're much faster. But you see how long it takes me to get that top edge over the ball. If someone's really good at this, like he showed when they roll that stick back, they can get underneath and knock this out. So what I tell guys is aim your clamp right to the right of the ball. So my right hand comes in hard and my left hand is actually snapping up so I can squeeze that ball into the ground. And the adjustment I would tell a face-off guy to make is the more angled I am in my stance, the more likely I'm going to be to step forward or punch my left hand out. In this case, rather than opening that gate, we want to think about closing it. So what we're going to tell our guys to do is go a little bit more square to their stance, start with more pressure on this glove, and they're just going to stab that right hand in and lift that left hand up. Now, if that pull gets a piece of it, you want to close this gate by throwing this left hand back and bringing my body to the right. So that would be the way that you would want to counter anyone trying to quick rake your face off guy. Now, talking through, if you had a guy who say you're going against a great pull, super, and your face off guy is not as athletic, what I would tell you to do on the wings is to make sure that when um, if you want to pop the ball out to your wing guys that you're setting them up for success by drive like starting up field driving off their guy and then popping in so this is the midfield line and we got our wing lines this is the most straight line and our team is here on this side we would want to tell your wings, all right, we're going to open this whole backside of the field up. Now, as soon as that whistle blows, they're going to drive their hands kind of at the hip of their opponent straight up field. So if these guys are trying to shut you off, they're not going to give up this defensive coverage. And once you drive that guy up field, you're going to break on a 45 degree angle straight back. Now our face off guy can kind of put this ball into space. Um, either here or here far enough away so that when their guy, their opponent goes for it, they can box them out and your wing guys are going to have first crack on this. Um, and I think that's really the best setup for it. If you have a guy who can win it to himself, I would tell them to still stay up here, open that whole back half of your field. The only problem is if he gets beat forward, you're really exposed. So the other option would be if you have a dominant draw guy who you really trust in this situation, um, and you tell your wing guys, hey, we're going to start back, right? And by starting back, what you're doing is challenging that opposing team to come with you down here. And if they do, your face-off guy can go forward or, you know, rotate back and toss it forward. And that would give you a fast break. And as soon as he's able to fast break once or twice against this pole um, anywhere forward, these guys are going to be forced to drop back. Right, so now I'll have free toss outs to both my wing guys if the opposing team's not hip to hip. Now, we talked about defensive exits last time, and I think this is one of the like safest ways that you could pop the ball. And I know Tyler said he didn't love it against poles, but he kind of just did a variation of it where with that drag and kind of sweep across the ground. But I think. This is something that you really want to teach all your guys and have be a standard if they can't go forward because it's much safer possession-wise. And the big points, like when watching this video, 
think about teaching your guys to get their their get up on their toes, get their head down, pull this butt end counterclockwise, and swing their foot all the way around to make a wall so that when they drag and exit, the ball is completely shielded. So I think this is one that you can really hammer out with your guys as they get more and more comfortable with their face-offs. And this is an exit that they should be practicing almost every time they take draws. Set. What's going on guys? Coach Nardelli here, back for another episode of Workout Wednesday. Today we're going to be discussing one little detail that can help improve the efficiency of your defensive exits. What we're going to be working on today is as we go to pop that ball out after our counter rotation, when we flick this ball, we're going to flick it towards our left hip and we're going to subtly turn that right shoulder towards my left ear so I can gain an extra couple feet of separation and ensure that I pop and catch that ball cleanly. So I'm going to hop around and my goal when I do this is you guys can see I have my turf set up so that my midfield line is going to run vertically rather than horizontally. My goal is to pop that ball into this back right quadrant only counter rotating once so that when I get my head down I counter rotate and I pinch. I'm really forced to drag and turn and get that ball into this back right quadrant and really use my momentum to allow me to get out more cleanly and to create more space on these defensive exits. So again, I'm going to move a little bit forward this time. We are aiming to pop that ball to that back right quadrant with a subtle turn after we secure the clamp and make one counter rotation with the clamp. And now do this at your own pace. The more comfortable you get with it, start to pick the speed up and really test yourself so that you're ready for one move. Now I think when you, you talk about defensive exits and you're a little more detailed in your approach um, with how you coach it and telling guys to turn their shoulders more. And for the kids who get it, when you want to take things to the next level, I always like to use the clock system. So 12 three, six, nine. So we're always starting at nine. And we talked about a few other exits, like say the back door exit, right? Well, when we hop sideways so that we can go right or left, that's not very specific. So you have, if you have a kid who really understands and gets it, tell him when he pro hops to bring his left foot out to like 11, right? So if I were teaching the, the back door exit at an advanced level, I'd say, hey, when you pro hop, bring your left foot to 11, and that'll allow you to go out behind your body so that you're completely um, protected from your opponent. So I clamp, I pinch and hop, and that subtle little turn allows me to get out and protect my hand from my opponent. And it's that same thing with that defensive exit. As you kind of get ready to defensive exit, rather than just hopping, I'm going to try to hop all the way to the side of the stick so that I'm able to get out much more cleanly and utilize my momentum. Next, we're gonna talk about tie-ups um, or live face-offs with wing play. And I think this is something that can be really beneficial to practice, even if it's, if it's say, you know, 20 to 30 minutes a week throughout your entire blocks of practice planning. And the way I would set it up with a team, if you wanted to do all of uh, your whole team, I would have your face-off guys start with their sticks both half clamped and now when they come down you're gonna have the wing guys line up on the circle so that you're really tightening this up and your face off guys are really gonna have to work to get the ball out both of their exits and they're gonna have to play three on three against each other in this tight space and you could do winning team gets to you know go to goal or the losing faceoff guy sits out and you play a six on five. So there's a lot of different creative ways that you could play out of this. But I think having those guys start on the circle and having the faceoff guys sticks both touching the ball, you know, promotes the tie up game practice, which everybody I think needs. And it also promotes those guys um, really having to exit in tight spaces or toss the ball out to their teammates and communicate.
guys welcome back to another episode of work however we're gonna do them with the pole kind of hovering around that face-off circle to give us a little bit more of a live look at exits so i got my buddies max and davis here and they're gonna simulate a perfect 50 50 tie up and then they're gonna go on my whistle buzzer if you guys haven't seen one of these great for practicing with a couple people you guys don't have to pass the whistle back and forth just a nice little fox 40 handheld whistle so on my whistle you guys are gonna go i'm gonna hover around with this pole and not only do they have to evade one another they have to try to evade me so i'm all-time defense and then we'll rotate as we go through down set Max did a perfect job, used the right pop perfectly to get away from me as he saw me out of the corner of our eye. So one thing we can do, we can kind of utilize that tripod position when we hop up to buy an extra second or two to get away from that pole. We'll go one more. And this can easily be done with a short stick as well. Uh, if you guys don't have access to pole, a pole, I'm gonna start on a different side this time to give them a little bit different look. Down, set. Important first time ground balls. Both those guys missed it on that time. We go one more. And again, I'm trying to sc scramble around that tie up, hunt these guys' butt ends as wing guys are taught to do. Down. Now, the way I would coach this individually is you would have one face off guy starting down, right? And I would tell him, hey, you're going to rotate around the ball until you hear me blow another whistle. So this guy is going to have the ball, and he's going to be eyes closed. So if myself and my teammate started on the other side, the only rule is we have to stay a stick length away. Now, as the coach blows the whistle, and I rotate around with my eyes closed, when I hear that second whistle, I have to open my eyes, hop, and kind of get a gauge of where those guys are. And now I'm going to have to either head fake, try to toss that ball nice and low or pop it where they're not and find my safe space. And that's a great drill that you guys could have players rep out to really work on their spatial awareness. And that's been one of our favorites that we do in tight spaces, um, even working with large groups. Now, face-off shooting, I think anytime you, you try to teach your face-off guys, whether you're coaching a FOGO or someone who's a really athletic midfielder, how to shoot, the best thing they can do is almost like try to replicate how long sticks shoot. And I think this is something I've been able to have a lot of success with throughout my career because I was taught the proper way in college by Coach Brecht. He always said to think about being in a phone booth, getting my elbows kind of out and up. And now when I bring this stick up kind of above my face, I want to think about my thumb coming to my forehead and snapping down to my target with my wrist so I don't have to bring my stick up behind my head. Most times when face-off guys win draws, they're coming down and guys are trailing them. So they wrongfully bring the stick back, they get checked instead of a transition opportunity at the loss of possession. So number one, they need to be able to throw this pass in front of their face to this point attackman with their arms all the way extended, almost like a lever pass. So they pull this bottom hand and just push that top hand. And that's pretty easy. It doesn't have to be a hard pass. All they need to do is get to get that defenseman to commit by turning their hips towards me and throw it. Now, if they reverse rotate, means sliding from the lefty base, they need to be able to throw this pass too, where their hands are in the front of their face. They turn this top hand over and they can flick it to that lefty attackman or throw a shovel pass to that lefty attackman. If they can make those two plays, you're going to be really dangerous in transition, not to mention if they're able to shoot out of this and protect their stick from either straight above the head, just to my right ear, or just to my left ear, almost kind of like a twister shot. Those three shots are really easy to practice. You can just stand there, as you'll see in this drill, and work on it. You start up on your toes to really you know, mimic falling forward when you're running full speed. Um, but I think this is a great skill you can have your draw guys work on that can pay off immensely if teams don't like to slide the face off guys because they don't think they're going to be great when they shoot. And then the last point is most goalies expect face off guys to shoot low. So when you bring your hands high, 
who are always starting to dip a little bit. And it's really easy to teach guys to shoot like offside high or offside tip rate for the pipe. That way, if they miss, you guys are always getting possession shots and you're not losing possession on what should have been a transition opportunity. episode of Workout Wednesday, and I'm just here grabbing a little trouble figuring out a new topic because we've done so many, which is pretty cool. Make sure you check out all our packs forward, and they bring their hands back like an on-the-run shot, and although it's essential to have that on-the-run shot in your game as a face-off guy because you are a midfielder first and foremost, I think the more appropriate shot as if we win that face-off four, most of the time we're shooting down the middle with pressure behind us, is an over the head or a snapshot, I like to call it, where I'm mostly shooting with my wrist, kind of keeping the stick in front of my face so it's protected, maybe throwing a fake either direction to hold the slide, and then shooting without bringing the ball behind my head and shoulders. So the first three in this drill I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna shoot with my feet, plant it, and I'm really focusing on putting my hands up and snapping my thumb towards the target. I'm gonna lean kind of on the front of my toes and balls of my feet as if I'm falling forward. So I'm going to in front of my face. Corners. Quick release. Now as I get more and more comfortable with this drill, I'm gonna do it from running so I have a couple more balls in my head. Same thing, I'm gonna keep that stick in front of my toe and the feet. Snap and try to hit the corner. Really just avoid hitting the goalie here. Because most of the time, you're in way too tight for them to even see the ball. Now, small kind of pointer on that is if guys are getting trailed, an easy way to avoid getting trail checked is they're always expecting to, to check that right hand. So if you bring this up like you're going to shoot righty, a lot of times they're going to bite. So I've taught a half pump where I bring the stick from my left ear to my right ear and then back to the front of my face. So as soon as I see that defenseman checking my peripherals, now I know I have enough room to load it up and let it go a little bit faster from further out. You could also teach choke up shooting where even in that drill, you see I'm bringing my hands back a little bit behind my head. We can teach choke up shooting or you teach that half pump to a left-handed just quick bounce shot. And I think high bouncers really work in those situations but you risk hitting the goalie. So it's just best to teach your kids to shoot for high targets. Next, we have counters, and I've really been um, – it's hard to teach counters when you're doing stuff um, on your own. So we talked about these last time. We're just going to revisit them. I think Max Adler does a great job in this video with me of kind of helping me break it down and adding stuff that I don't even, like, you know, think about because he also has a really interesting perspective on the faceoff, and um, I think this is a great video for learning counters, and if you could show your faceoff, guys. I think it'd be very, very helpful for them. The key with counters is you got to practice them, just like clamping, just like anything else. So for, like we talked about with your long pull, you need that pull to practice facing off. Even if it's five minutes a day, it'll pay off when you're not getting crushed in possession one time. Coach Max Adler with Denver Outlaws, and we're each going to show you one pre-whistle counter move and one post-whistle counter move. And what we mean by pre-whistle is a predetermined move for the whistle. So Coach Adler is going to show us his counter move if he were to, to be kind of conceding face-offs or trying to change it up on his opponent. Yeah, so sometimes you're not as quick on the whistle every time. So one move I really like to do is you can do the standing or knee down. I like to do it standing up because I'm in a more athletic position. But the first thing I do is my hand position. This left wrist, usually when you're facing off, the left wrist is cocked back. This time it's cocked the other way. And what I do is I come down and I, as I uncock my wrist, I'm just pulling my hands and getting the ball. And it's just a little quicker variation. Um, instead of trying to swipe at the ball, which I feel is a little slower, I'm just really light on my hands here. And I'm, all I'm doing is just cocking this wrist down and pulling out and having the edge of my sidewall right here 
catch the ball. So that's more of like your traditional laser type yep. move, trying to get the ball down the line to create 50-50 situation. Great move, a lot of people tend to do it. Most people don't do it correctly, and it's important that you guys do it the way that he told you, because when we see a lot of people rake, they pick this hand up, and now they only use about that top quarter of their top, their bottom sidewall to try to rake their plastic or rake the ball. The next move that I'm gonna show you guys, I like to call the scissor rake. And if we were lining up, I like to take a little bit wider of a stance from a stand-up neutral grip approach. I'm trying to slice my right hand in to the spot in his mesh that catches, and I pull my left hand back so I can almost pull his stick down the line. It's important because Max, Max's move is more depending on your speed. If you can quick rake that ball out down the line, you may be successful. Mine is more so trying to deter him from clamping the ball and make this situation messy. Again, both are used to create 50-50 situations much better than conceding face-offs. At least give yourself and your wings a little bit of a chance to buy those guys time to get in and make it a 50-50 ground ball situation. Next, we're gonna talk about post-whistle counter moves. So one that Max likes, he'll, he'll tell you guys a little bit about. Yeah, so I do the quick rig and this is, so what happens is I do the quick rig and I'm not gonna be able to get it out here every time. So sometimes I go to do the quick rig and it gets stuck in the top of his stick. When I see it stuck in the top of his stick, since I'm already standing up, what I like to do, I'll step here with my left foot and then come under and lift up there. Then that creates, that's essentially like winning a ground ball through my own legs. And it's a great counter move to do. Um, just something to switch it up and use your wings and your own athleticism. So notice, where did you come when you pulled my hand up? So when I pulled your hand up, I'm not coming forward like that. I'm coming at an angle through my own legs. And he's up right underneath my glove. Yeah. Anything above this glove up, immediately you guys are gonna be whistled for a violation. So unless you guys practice this with a partner and when you guys are doing live reps a lot, you probably shouldn't use this move because you're just gonna be getting your team bios and no coach wants to see that. Now, my post whistle counter move, it's a little bit different, but it's predicated on the same thing, which is taking pressure off their right hand. So if I lose in any tie up situation, right? And Max goes to pinch, as soon as I see this air underneath his shaft in the ground, I'm gonna try to grab his thumb with the top corner of my throat and pull him down the line that way to create a ground ball over here. Again, if I, if I start with that scissor rake and he clamps and pinches, or if he goes to defensive exit and I follow his butt end, I can still find that right hand and try to lift it up. Again, both require a lot of practice, and if you hold it in there for more than half a second, you're gonna get called no matter what you do. Both are predicated on taking pressure off that right hand, really lifting them off the ground. So use your legs, use your entire body, try to get your teammates involved. Thanks. So I think that's a great one for really just teaching people how they should be countering proper ways to do it without getting violations. And if you guys can be successful in teaching your, not only your, your counter guys, your backups or long sticks, these moves, but your face off guys. If, and I always try to teach kids this, if there's 20 draws in a game and you can steal back one or two and you guys clamp 50, 50, your team is 60% instead of 40%, right? You win 12 instead of 10 face offs. That could be a huge difference. If you guys want your kids to get recruited, they play in the summer circuit. Coaches are going to recruit a 60% guy any day of the week over a 50% guy, right? For whatever reason, they love that number. Um, so I think it's a great way to, to work on these counters. Next, I'm going to get, show you a drill as we kind of get close to the end with the last two. Um, working on angles. Now, if you have kids who want to get extra work, kids you teach at practice, you know, an hour or two a week um, where they're like devoting themselves to face-offs unless you got somebody who's just fogoing. Right. Um, but anytime you, you know, somebody is practicing on their own, they're, they're going to need some guidance. And I think this drill is really good for teaching them the proper angles and just simplifying how they can reinforce that they're practicing the right habits. Right. Because when kids are facing off, you're either practicing good or bad habits. And if we can prevent them practicing bad habits, they're going to get so much better, so much better. I want to talk about using obstacles and markers to create visuals so that you can practicing really good habits, punching on the right angles and being efficient with every single thing that you do. So right now I have this first long stick and you guys can use cones or whatever you may choose. 
on that 45 degree angle in which I want to punch towards the ball. So this is going to tell me, hey, I can't punch forward here. I still want to get down the line while bringing that left hand in my body around the ball. Next, I'm going to set up my second move and give myself like a little gateway to exit through. So right now I'm going to practice on a strong first move, getting around with my second move to maybe 12 o'clock and then exiting on that diagonal or that 45 to get away from my opponent. And this is a great drill to do not only to reinforce all these things that we talk about and break down in some of our smaller segments, but to really just give yourself a new avenue to kind of train. And I find by giving students visuals, we're much more effective in everything that we do and we're much more efficient with using our time. Next is another one that I really like. And here, if I wanted to practice a backdoor exit, I want to imagine my opponent is going to be here and he's ready to check. So I want to exit on this back door, kind of 45 degree angle, ensuring I'm turning my head, shoulders, hips, and body away as I get out in that direction. And again, I'm going to take one, one of these shafts, put them on my next 45, so that I know where to punch off my first move. Down set. And again, kind of using the locker and being creative, creating these little gateways so that I ensure I'm getting out on the right angles. Next, I'm going to create a simple one for my, my defensive exit or defensive escape. And again, imagine that opponent's here and I want to get out back door. Notice, every time I do these, as I see the shafts, those are my markers or my kind of visual cues that, hey, you got to turn your shoulders here because that's where a check's going to be in the game. And I'm overemphasizing those turnaways with my shoulders, hips, and body and everything that I do to ensure I'm protecting the ball and gaining possession for my team. Thank you guys for So super simple, right? And it hits those three most common exits that we kind of talked about, that back door going forward into the left or our fast break in the defensive exit. And I think something as simple as that can really – guide your students practice to make sure that you're reinforcing the right things all the time now our last one is one of my favorites it's called backhand down gbs and what we want to do for these backhand down gbs it's almost like a combination of scooping the ball and then picking up uh, like getting that backhand down by flipping our stick and really making sure they come all the way down and we actually scoop a roll of tape here in this video um, but I think you guys will enjoy this. This is a great one to have your kids do if they're doing work on their own or if you really want to challenge them. Um, and here's our last one, and we'll field some questions. And as you guys can see on the doc, I got all the stuff from the first session on here as well. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Workout Wednesday. This week we're going to address two topics that I think a lot of face-off guys neglect, especially in season. First, when you get in trouble or if you're ever in an emergency, when someone gets up to counter and you're unsure of where to exit, we're going to work on our through the legs exits, trying to keep it three to five yards away so I'm going to aim for just past that white line, keeping both hands down. My left hand kind of stays planted and my right hand drags back across the turf as I turn my knuckle over, kind of like I'm hiking a football. And then then, as I go to pick that ball up, I'm going to take my fingers off my butt end to work on getting that backhand down. As soon as I scoop this ball, I'm going to drop it, turn, stay low, and we're going to toss some tape out. I'm going to flip my butt end around and scoop with the butt end through this roll of tape. But the tape's moving around a little bit, simulating a difficult ground ball, and I have to get really low. So here, we'll demo. And so both those we might have, as you guys seen, um, cut the video. So hey guys, welcome back to another back. episode of Workout Wednesday. This week's topic is going to be called. I hate when it auto plays like that. Um, but I was able to get it first time on both. I don't even know. Like I, I think it's pretty hard, and kids really struggle with that one. So it really reinforces keeping that backhand down. So for not right now, I'll throw this link in the chat again um, for you guys. Um, but otherwise, we can take questions. Um, 
or cover any other topics briefly that you guys would like to hit. Yep, the Q&A box is open. Um, let me just see here. Make sure that goes up. And the link's in the chat if any of you guys want to grab it um, that weren't able to catch it last time. There we go. I think that went out. Someone, if one of the attendees just could confirm, um, respond back. I'm hoping that, that went in there. Great session. Appreciate that. That was, uh, oh, yep. Yeah. Pat, thank you. Appreciate it. Um, oh, that was just the doc coming back. It's live. What is the need on? Yeah, we talked about them. Rotating that left hand is a telltale sign. Yeah. That question was answered. No open to me. All right, Brad. Well, if we don't have any questions, we can get these guys out of here. I want to thank the, especially the guys who did both sessions, but Lacrosse Summit, all the sponsors, and then you guys for making this possible. It's always a really good, um, you know, challenge and test to see how well I can teach others virtually. And I think especially coaches are, are people that I'm always trying to empower and, you know, give more knowledge about the face up because you guys are the really the ones working with these guys all the time and have like, the accessibility to, to reinforce this stuff. I mostly only get, you know, the select group of kids that I work with throughout New England and then get to touch here and there um, when I get to travel and get to clinics. So I really appreciate you guys, you know, paying it forward and helping these kids out. Thanks so much. Yeah, no, great job. I mean, the, the position itself has evolved so much and, and so often. I, I mean, the level of teaching, I mean, I, when I started in the NLL, I was, you know, I took base offs. I was there for a long time and um, I can tell you right now that many of the guys that were around, we didn't take it to the same educational level that, that you guys do. So, um, yeah, well, thanks for having me, Brad. I really appreciate it. If you could share the recordings with me, that'd be awesome. And otherwise we are good. Yeah. If anyone has questions or uh, wants to connect going forward on that Google doc has my email. Um, feel free to reach out anytime. We do have like a, a subscription library where if you guys are interested in getting all of our drills, everything that we do, game breakdowns, um, you could contact me about that, and that's something that we would love to push with teams and programs so that their kids can remain educated and continue to get better as we do. Oh, we've got a question in here. During the obstacle poles, you're exaggerating your trail foot. Was that on purpose rather than stepping? Yeah, I was out dragging my trail foot because I wanted to really reinforce, like, I think you're talking about, and I'll angle this down again. Sorry about that. I think you're talking about on the one where I'm going backwards, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I was really exaggerating, dragging this trail foot um, when I went back. And I think the reason being is as I'm here, I really am working on dragging away from that guy. I'm just like I said, on your defensive exit, you can think about swinging your feet more. So now you don't have to exaggerate that trail foot. But I think that was more so just me really emphasizing that drag away. Awesome. Okay. Um, yeah, Joe, you know what? Great job. Um, we'll get these encoded and uploaded and I'll share those links with you. Um, and you'll be able to grab those as well. I uh, appreciate your time. Thanks for both sessions. You know, yeah, wonderful. you got it, man. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward to working together again in the future. Yeah, we will do. We'll talk to you soon. All right, later.